What if our world was filled with people who embodied the ideals of the peaceful warrior, who had inner strength and outer strength that always sought peace? What if there was a movement for people to become peaceful warriors? And what if you began that movement right now? Today, I want to share with you a guidebook, a manual, if you will, to becoming a peaceful warrior. Now, there's a very vital part of this manual, and that is that it is not complete without you. Partly, I mean you watching it and perhaps experimenting with the ideas here and trying to embody this ideal of a peaceful warrior. But, and a little bit easier, <laughs> more practical way, what I mean is that for each chapter of this manual, in the comments, if you would write, chapter one, and then put any links that you would like to include to articles, to YouTube channels, to specific videos where people give you training in the things I'm talking about. Because even though this is going to be a longer video, I'm going to be trying to fit a lot into a relatively short amount of time. And there are amazing teachers all over the world who can share things like really good martial arts instruction, really good meditation instruction. You, I'm depending on, to put the sources that have worked best for you, that you have found most meaningful, down in the comments. Remember, write the chapter and then leave a link there. So what is a peaceful warrior? When I think of the word warrior, we often think of somebody just fighting and killing other people. And in many ways, that's our current cultural meaning of the word. But ideally, we're seeing less and less of that in the world. And we can take that idea of a warrior and broaden it out. It's not going to leave out the possibility of fighting, but it's going to include a lot more. So what if we take the word warrior and we say that what a warrior is, is a person who deals with conflict in some way. And a peaceful warrior is someone who does that in a very specific way that leads towards less conflict. What I mean by that is that when we look around us at the world, we see that conflict is a fairly common part of at least the modern human condition. We can debate about People of old, as much as we want, none of us were there. So we don't know for sure. But we do see around us, that's one thing we know for sure, people having conflict to various degrees. We see people fighting and killing each other with weapons. We see people arguing and losing their heads when they're trying to have a debate about a subject. We see the more subtle conflicts of our media kind of grabbing people's minds and taking their minds over. And most of us are familiar with inner conflict. And that can be as simple as we sit down to the computer to answer some emails to some friends and we find our hand going over to hit YouTube and we know we're gonna go watch some junk videos. Do we do it or not? I think of dealing with conflict in four levels. Now, the first level is the one that we are used to seeing. A lot of our superheroes, when they, in the movies, you're going to notice most of them are just really good at fighting because fighting is the way to resolve conflict. We see this in our wars in the world. And so there's a lot of social conditioning telling us that fighting is a way to resolve conflict. Now, granted, sometimes... That kind of meeting conflict with aggression can beat the conflict down. But in general, in general, it creates more conflict. We see this in our wars where we go in, we try to beat down a group that has a different worldview than ours. 
and we can beat it down for a while, but because of that aggression, in a way, it often comes back stronger. So we can temporarily fight down some kinds of conflict, but often this method is just a breeding ground for more conflict. And it reinforces the idea that if I want to get my idea across, I have to be the one that is more capable of shedding blood. The next higher level of dealing with conflict is de-escalation. And this is where we take that conflict energy and we meet it in a non-aggressive way and we defuse it and we make it less. This is a super powerful way of dealing with conflict. It's great, but again, it doesn't necessarily meet the conflict at its source. We may be able to de-escalate someone, a situation in this case, but it's likely that that person, for instance, will escalate again in the near or distant future because the source of the conflict has not been met. The next higher way of dealing with conflict is transformation. Here, we move in with the person in a different way and we are able to actually transform the source of their conflict. This is where the way of the peaceful warrior starts to become very powerful because now we're not just dealing with symptoms, but we're starting to create a cure. And finally, the highest way of dealing with conflict is seeing the conflict within ourselves and seeing how we often are the cause of the conflict that we see around us. As you can probably see before we go deeper into these in their own chapters, the very easiest way to deal with conflict is that first one, to meet conflict with aggression. That is a reactionary method of dealing with things. It's easy because it's automatic. We see something, we react, we spaz out, we attack back. That is why it's also the lowest level. The highest level is the toughest to look at. That's where we see that we often are the source of the conflict we witness around us. Those are difficult words to swallow. Our ego wants to say, no, it's other people's fault. But we often, not always, but we often play a part in the conflict around us. We'll see that throughout this manual and we'll talk about it when we get to the chapter on inner peace. Now in my life journey, I have always been really big into martial skills. And this started when I was nine with Taekwondo and then led on a whole journey. At this point in my life, I am familiar with firearms. I've done some work with knives, with swords, with everyday hand weapons that you'd pick up, staff or Kali sticks, things that, okay, a broomstick, right? There you've got a staff. You break it in half, you have another kind of weapon. My favorite of all those along this journey has always been unarmed skills. The reason for that is that it's something that you always have unless you're injured. But if everything's stripped away, you know, from my wilderness stuff. I love that idea of being capable at the most stripped down level. And then if you have more tools at your disposal, awesome, great, know how to use them, but be capable with very little. That's why you don't try and pull guard. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. Oh, oh, nice. You almost had me. You almost had me. Oh. 
Oh. oh. It's like I thought that was it. I needed to give warning, you know. Yeah. I don't even I don't even know if you're going 100. <laughs> percent <laughs> No, I'm trying. Oh. No. <laughs> I was down there for so long. <laughs> I can't breathe normally. I was in trenches. <laughs> <laughs> now you may be asking if this is about being a peaceful warrior why are we talking about martial skills martial skills are about hurting people to answer this in part i'll bring up the example of a man that i know and respect greatly and he's a relative and friend of mine and he is a marine once a Marine, always a Marine. He was a Marine in Vietnam and was a police chief. And he will tell stories about having his gun at the side. And he looks at so many examples in the media today of officers and the first thing they're doing is they're pulling out their sidearm. And he said, back in the day, we usually did not pull out our sidearm. In fact, it was quite rare. We were taught to de-escalate. We were taught other methods of dealing with situations. And we recognized that if we pull out that gun, that escalates the situation. When you pull out that gun, <clears throat> everything goes up. And the chance of somebody getting hurt goes up a lot. And the other day, I saw on the Good News Network, a police officer, who was called to the scene of a dog that had fallen through ice. And it's a dog, right? The thing to do is say, hey, sorry, or call in some emergency people that can get out some proper gear and go out there and do an ice rescue. I don't know, maybe he watched my ice rescue video and felt confident. Maybe he just wasn't thinking about preserving himself first. But what he did, is he just stripped off his excess gear and he went out there on the ice, brought the dog out, boom. It was beautiful. It was heroic. It was what I consider to be the best quality that humans can have. And that is when we are not so self-absorbed that we are only thinking about our own preservation. And hopefully what I've said has just put more weight into that question of why would we be learning harmful based skills if we're talking about being a peaceful warrior, if we're talking about not being concerned about defending ourselves first, but maybe helping others first. And the reason is this, that when we have those skills, we have two things in our toolkit. One is that Sometimes, despite our best efforts, a situation will escalate to the point of violence. I got to train in my youth with some cage fighter dudes. They were badass. <laughs> and they, oh my gosh, they were fun to watch, but they were extremely, extremely aggressive towards each other, towards the people around them. So in my training, I got to do some pretty good kind of fight clubby type stuff. But I was always considered the peacekeeper because I remember many instances of those gloves being tossed off because somebody hit somebody else too hard. They lost their temper. And I was the one that usually could get into that situation and defuse them. Not always, but often. I could not have done that if I didn't have the second tool that this gives us. And that is confidence. When we have those martial skills in our tool set, especially, and this is really important, when they're martial skills that have been tested under pressure. So I 
might get some flack for this, but you know, I did some training in traditional martial arts. That was great. It supposedly are taught techniques that can really be effective, but you can never use those techniques on other people. So you never really learn for sure because they're so dangerous. And often you've never really been hit. You've never taken a solid punch to the face. You've never been knocked out. You've never been choked out. These things kind of need to experience our martial skills under pressure for them to give us a real confidence. Now, when we have that real confidence, then it allows us to step in to a situation and try to deal with the conflict in a higher way. Because we know that A, we could defend ourselves or we could defend other bystanders or somebody who's a victim in this situation. And we have that, that confidence. At least we're going to put up a good fight. That confidence also comes into play in those cases where it just does devolve into a violent situation. And again, that is extremely rare, but it does happen. I'll share a story when I first really felt the difference that this made, the martial training made in my life. And I was 19 years old. This was in Hudson, Wisconsin, and I was at a party. And we were all having a good time. I was in the kitchen with some people talking. And suddenly this girl about my age walks into the kitchen and she has multiple lacerations. She's bleeding. She's crying. And she's saying, somebody please go get my baby somebody please go get my baby she explains that next door she lives right next door and in an apartment and her baby is up there and her boyfriend just attacked her the right thing to do you know reflecting back maybe call the police although as soon as we brought up the police there was something about her Maybe something in her past, or I don't know what it was, but she said, don't call the police. They'll never believe me. Don't call the police. What happened with that side of the story, I'll leave. But I felt I had to go get this baby. Baby was in danger. And I had been training super hard with those cage fighter guys right then. And I felt super confident in my martial skills. So I went next door. Very vividly, I can remember this. Up the stairs into her apartment, door was cracked open, and right to the right, there was the kitchen. And there was, it was like in a movie, there was a butcher knife, uh, chef knife on the ground, and blood drops <laughs> all over the ground. And it was eerie, because I had spent so much of my life kind of filled with anxiety. And this was a moment of clarity. I felt totally there totally calm, totally peaceful. I went room to room. I found the baby, took the baby up, went back next door, gave her her baby. <sighs> and looking back, I just remember being startled at not feeling any <gasps> adrenaline, not feeling any fear. And I can only say that this came from the confidence that I was building by training in martial skills and doing so under pressure. Now, as I said, an aggressive reaction is, uh, it's, it's kind of the easiest and the lowest kind of way that we can deal with conflict. People get hurt, and ideally, if you're a compassionate person, you don't want anybody getting hurt. And it breeds more conflict over time. My mom worked in domestic violence. And she saw this pattern all the time. People saw in their childhood that punching, hitting, kicking, name calling, these were the ways to deal with any kind of conflict situation. And it carries on often in the next generation. Sometimes someone is strong enough, really turns things around. That's awesome when that happens. But very often, the abusers will say that they were abused. And there's often a chain going backwards, generation from generation. So if we can find a different way to deal with it, now we're confident because we have 
martial skills at our disposal, but we know that those are there. If we need them, we probably won't. Now we learn to de-escalate. De-escalation is such an awesome skill. And I'm going to use the example of a, an aggressive person that you see who is intent on hurting another person. But this de-escalation doesn't have to be that dramatic. It can be even more dramatic where there's groups of people. It can be less dramatic in the sense that Somebody walks in, it's a loved one of yours, but they've lost their temper over things and they start to snap at you. That can be de-escalated too. And de-escalation is actually not that difficult. It's something that we use on that subtle level in my family all the time. And I'm going to go over the skills on how to make it happen. The first part of this is realizing two important starting points in any kind of a conflict situation. The first is that the person's mind, the aggressor's mind, is caught in a feedback loop, in a chain reaction. Now, we call this <laughs> being in the sympathetic nervous system. This is our fight or flight, fight or flight response. It's when situation stressors have built up to a point that our mind starts to just roll. It gets a momentum of being in conflict mode. When this happens, our vision, and I don't just mean our visual vision, but I mean our mental capabilities, our ability to see how much is involved in the situation narrows way down. And often all we can do is feel the anger or the frustration inside of us and shoot it out and shoot it out and shoot it out. And the second important thing to remember about the beginning of any of these situations is that when you encounter a situation like this, you walk into a conflict situation, the factor that is most likely to escalate that situation and make it worse is you, me, you, the person there that has come into the situation. And Boy, I've seen this operating all the time in people around me, and I've seen it inside of myself, where I will go into a situation, I'll see a conflict, and then use the opposite of de-escalation techniques. Go in and yell at somebody, tell them they're wrong, blah, 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 blah. Then I become the escalator. I'm actually making the problem worse. And participating in that conflict and in any violence that unfolds afterwards. This is what I call deep responsibility. And it's something we'll talk about more in later chapters of this video. But it's something that we kind of have to own up to. This deep responsibility in saying, when I walk into a conflict situation, I am the thing most likely to make the situation worse. So I have a huge amount of responsibility to do the opposite. Now, in order to not become the person that escalates a situation, we have to start developing a, a practice of stress inoculation. I'll cover that more deeply in chapter 10. But in short, if I am going to lose my head when someone starts swearing at me or yelling at me, or swinging some punches at me, if I lose my cool and I go straight into spaz out mode back, then you can see what I've done adding to the situation. And I will not have a chance of de-escalating the situation unless I inoculate myself to some stress. There's a lot of ways to do that, but if you can get someone to get up in your face so close that you feel their spittle on your face, and just unload on you and see if you can step back and just relax into it. See it, feel it just as sound waves bumping against you, little speckles of moistness 
going against your face and just be there present without getting sucked into that energy really powerful this is great if you have sparring partners and you can allow things to get a little more intense if you can develop that skill of being calm in the face of oh, tons of stuff coming at you again we'll cover this more in chapter 10 but it's very important that you practice some forms of stress inoculation otherwise you are going to be pulled into the conflict energy now the secret to de-escalation is a skill that rebecca taught me she read a book on this a while back and it is a skill that makes so much difference in your life in all of your interactions with other people and it is also a highly misunderstood skill it's called validation and validation is simply the practice of when somebody is having high emotions of acknowledging their right to have emotions hopefully most of us believe in freedom and the last thing we would want to tell somebody is that they do not have the right to feel a certain way so when we go in to validate we reaffirm to somebody that we see the emotion they're feeling and we respect their right to have that emotion notice that there's a huge difference between feelings and actions i could be really upset about something really angry i can feel those emotions that's a different thing than if i start unloading on my wife and taking it out on her now my actions have become not really very acceptable my feelings absolutely acceptable my actions no nah. so validation is not about validating somebody's right to beat somebody else up or to harm another person with their words it is about saying i see your emotions and i respect your right to have those emotions often there's a, a coming together and saying wow i think i might even feel the same way if this was happening to me lots of ways to practice validation and hopefully some of you will put some links down in the comments under this chapter with some good tutorials if i remember i'll try to put that book that rebecca first read in the description of the video so validation when i validate somebody the first thing i'm doing is i'm connecting up with them and i'm saying i recognize your right to feel and very importantly i am waiting until i see that the person feels validated what we're essentially doing is listening going into listening mode and making that person feel heard when you feel heard that's automatically going to take that sympathetic nervous system that momentum that's rushing forward into conflict and it starts to derail it. it starts to wiggle it and make it looser because boy that conflict mind really feeds off the thought of i'm right the other person's wrong when somebody else comes in and says yes you are right wow that starts to take a little of the oomph out of it and again i mean right in our feelings so how we're feeling our emotions always right how somebody is feeling in that moment doesn't mean that we can't help them shift or change that feeling which is actually what we're probably going to do here in a moment through our de-escalation but the way they're feeling right then we're validating it saying yes you are heard when we see that they are heard when we see that in their body language ah, the tension starts to release in their facial expression then we have the next step in de-escalation and that is acknowledging a person's again freedom we're talking about here their freedom of choice saying i hear you and i know you're probably feeling really drawn towards that action that violent action you're going to perform and you have a right 
to perform any action you wish. Not necessarily telling the person at this point that if they do perform that violent action, you're probably going to try to stop them in another way. But respecting their freedom of choice and saying, you have a choice here. And I'm just here with you to witness your choice. And there's probably some other choices you could make too. You might even suggest some other choices. But you're making sure that that person feels the freedom to choose. As soon as they feel constrained, as soon as you're telling them what to do or what not to do, you are going to escalate that situation again. When somebody feels like they have the freedom to choose, after they have been de-escalated through validation, then their rational mind is going to start talking again. And they're going to say, whoa, do I really want to do what I was going to do? And you are probably going to find that in 99% of the cases, the person chooses a better action when you have taken them through that de-escalation. Here's where I'm going to plug back when we were talking in chapter two about developing martial skills. I'm going to plug grappling skills. Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I don't want to discount what people learn in high school wrestling. I'll explain why. Any kind of effective grappling skill where you aren't constrained by too many rules. So if you're training in MMA, you're getting the really good stuff where you're combining the grappling with striking and everything else that can happen on the ground in a real situation. Now some people will say, Kenton, that's silly. You must learn the striking arts because grappling is useless, famously in a multiple attacker situation. So, A, okay, maybe there's some truth to that. B, multiple attacker situations do happen. In my experience of witnessing conflict, not very common, but if a, a group of aggressors has a choice, they're going to choose multiples against one person. Next, Punching and kicking tends to be a lot less effective than we think. You've probably all heard examples or seen videos of people who can be shot multiple times with a 9mm handgun and they still keep coming and still keep fighting. It, a single punch, a single kick, we're used to seeing that in the movies, boom, just takes somebody out and knocks them out. Sure, it's possible. And if you're a really skilled boxer, you might be able to just poof, lay people out, jaw hit, jaw hit, one by one with your boxing skills. But for most of us, the truth about striking is that it's a lot messier than you think. And people can take a lot of strikes. And if you think you're going to strike that person and then strike that person while others are coming up behind you, you're going to get taken from the back and you're gonna go on to the ground. It's very ubiquitous in any kind of a real combat situation. So having those ground skills is super essential. And you make the argument that a well-executed rear naked choke is going to take somebody out of the situation much quicker than 99% of the punches or kicks that someone's going to be able to deliver. So if you learn those grappling skills, they're super, super powerful. You can even be on the ground, have somebody, and use them as a shield. Now, in the much more likely situation of a single person being the aggressor, and maybe they are past de-escalation, they're already into a stage of committing some violence. That's, again, where grappling is super, super effective. Because if you can take somebody down and hold them, if you're training in jujitsu, that's going to be in a submission of some kind. <laughs> the high school wrestler types, often they can hold somebody down. They don't have to even be doing a submission. They've learned to pin people and can hold them there. When somebody's down on the ground, you now have time to talk with them. You have time to begin a de-escalation. 
And that is what's beautiful about grappling. Punches and kicks do nothing unless they hurt somebody. Grappling, you still retain the ability to have everybody come out unhurt. And you still retain the ability to de-escalate somebody. Once they're down, you can deliver a little pain or you're just holding them and they can't move. Talk time. Begin that validation. Start working them down. And you have plenty of time to do it if you have them in a good hold. Now we're leveling up again. This is transforming conflict. Now, we're going to get a little more esoteric here and a little bit more difficult. But in that way of the peaceful warrior, we're going to do tough. We're going to go into difficulty and we're always going to try to deal with conflict in the most peaceful way possible. Now we're seeing that we have a ladder going downward and we can go down that ladder if we need to. But we have many skills that can be exercised before we get to that bottom level of meeting conflict with aggression. Now, transformation is something that I feel like I really integrated through the practice of Aikido, which is another martial art I trained in. And Aikido today famously has been, uh, I'm almost say, debunked in the sense that we have some pretty high level Aikido practitioners saying, look, a lot of the skills that are taught there aren't really effective unless somebody's working with you. And I'll have to admit that in my own Aikido training, there's a very strong emphasis on uke, on the, I'd be the person who is the, the aggressor whenever you're performing a skill, on them performing their aggression in a very uh, certain way. So it becomes very composed and dance-like, beautiful to witness. But if, if somebody comes in and does something different or gets really wild and spazzy, that is where I do not see the Aikido skills being as effective. Open to debate about that if you're an Aikido practitioner, maybe when you get super high level, but I just, I never witnessed any of my instructors or anybody that could really do it against a, an opponent that was resisting. That being said, Aikido had a huge, huge impact on me and lesson for me. And that was this entire concept of, of blending and flowing, taking in energy and moving with it. It completely altered my Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practice because you know, I'm not the biggest guy in the world. I've developed some decent strength for my size, but in general, when I go up against an opponent, they're gonna be bigger and stronger. So if I'm going to fight their muscle with my muscle, mm, but I've learned that through yielding, Selective yielding, putting pressure just at the right time to make somebody think maybe that I'm resisting and releasing and yielding that I can move a person around really, really effectively in that way. So Aikido has this beautiful way of taking energy and coming in so that you are right there with the other person's center of energy. And when you're centered together like that, you're moving in unison, you become one thing. And this is where, when we're seeing conflict, we can embrace this idea of transformation by taking the lessons of Aikido and saying, okay, when that conflict comes in, you're gonna see how this ties in with the last chapter. When I can validate somebody i'm i'm using my words and i'm making them feel heard but i'm going to take it a step deeper and i'm going to really try to go into their shoes this is the skill called compassion and it's a vital skill 
for the peaceful warrior. Compassion is when we use our imagination, essentially, to really go into the situation another person is experiencing. So if I have somebody who has an ideology that is completely different, an idea about the world that's completely different and oppositional to mine, something magical happens when I come in and I say, I'm going to sit with you for a little bit. I'm going to sit with you and really try to see the world from your perspective. This is a level of validation and coming together that is extremely powerful because when we come together with somebody, that is the only time they will hear us. So not only when I practice this, do I start to understand that there are many different ways of seeing the world, that my way of seeing the world may not be as divinely correct as I believe it to be, that there may be some reasons that somebody who acts completely opposed to my ideas about the world is acting that way, and they may be actually some pretty valid reasons. When I start to see that, first of all, my mind broadens and it becomes less reactionary. Because now when I see something that opposes my ideals, I don't go into reaction mode. I say, I'd like to understand that more. I wonder where they're really coming from at a deep level. And when I do that, it also opens up the door. When someone is really being heard at this level, so much that you're willing to come in, see the world from their eyes, then they tend to be much more willing to hear the things that you have to say and your viewpoints. And what started as conflict can often turn into, if not a friendship, a dialogue of sharing and connecting. This is powerful, powerful stuff. When someone comes in opposing you really strongly, often you're going to have to use de-escalation techniques, first of all. But then if you're willing to go deeper, to sit down with that person after they've been de-escalated and say, I want to hear more. I want to know why you feel this. I'm really interested. If you're an explorer of the world, you'll be genuinely interested in other people's ideas. And when we go in like that, we start to form a bond with that person. And that doesn't have to be necessarily a lasting bond, but it's a bond that opens up the door to sharing. And this is where then you may have a chance to introduce some ideas. As you're hearing their ideas, they're going to be willing maybe to hear your ideas. And you have a chance at least of altering their conflict creation well. <laughs> the place from which conflict emerges in them. Now we've entered true peaceful warrior status, energy. When we're going in, meeting a conflict, doing what has to be done to de-escalate it, meeting that person on their ground and establishing enough of a dialogue that you can start to see where the source of their conflict is. And when you see that source of that conflict, then we have a chance to help them shift and change it. Now here's the toughest level. This is seeing that often when I witness conflict, it's coming from me. Again, our ego doesn't like to hear this, and it's so much easier to blame, to say it's other people's fault. But starting to notice how my inner conflict impacts the world around me. I started to notice this probably in my early 20s, late teens, when I started to see that if I was in a junky mood, real just kind of feeling eh about the world, that I saw that around me a lot. 
And that if I was feeling really, really loving, connected, compassionate, I saw that around me a lot. You've probably all heard the story about somebody who is just moved to a new area and they meet a local walking down the street or the beach and that local, they go up to that local and they say, hey, what are the people like around here? And the local says, well, what are the people like where you come from? And that person says, well, they were pretty mean, kind of nasty. And the local says, that's pretty much what you're going to find here. And then the next day, that same local is walking down the beach and another person comes up and says, hey, I'm new to the area. What are the people like around here? And that local says, well, what are the people like where you came from? Uh, the people where I came from were the nicest people you've ever met. It was incredible. I was really sad to have left. And the local says, that's pretty much what you're going to find here. And there's deep truth to this story. That what you carry inside of you is what you're going to witness to a large extent in the world around you. I'm not saying that if you have a totally peaceful heart, the entire world is going to appear peaceful to you. You're still going to see conflict. But it is odd how much conflict comes from us. And how does this happen? Some of it may be a little bit mystical. And I'm happy to go there and just say that maybe literally there's something we don't understand, some energy we give off that affects the world we perceive. But even if you want to just be purely in the non-mystical world, the facial expressions, my subtle body language, maybe the pheromones I give off, the words that I choose, the way I look at somebody, all these things have pretty strong effects on the moods of the people around us. And as we walk through the world as a peaceful warrior, you're going to find a lot less conflict. As we walk through the world angry, upset with everything around us, hateful of other people, we're going to see a much different world. And it's just simply how people are going to react to you. It's nothing more than that if you don't want to go mystical with it. All right, my friends, that is part one of this manual. Next week, I will be delivering part two of this manual in the final part. And together, these two hopefully will create a coursework for you in becoming a peaceful warrior. Next week, we're going to be talking about ways to develop the inner peace or the inner strength or resilience that allows us to not be a conflict generator ourselves. So essentially, next week is all about this last chapter of your inner state affecting the world you witness around you. And we're going to be talking about some practical methods of developing some skills that will help with that. Remember to add your training suggestions down in the comments. See you for the rest of this next week. Love to you all.